gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful once again for this opportunity that you've given us to just come together in this way and feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all the error, all of the ignorance, and all the foolishness, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth, for it's in Christ's name. I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, and we're in the 16th chapter. And we are about to see that in the final chapter here, how that we've been cautioned by the Holy Spirit to work, to watch, or, or scope out would be the literal Greek translation to be on the lookout for those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which we have learned. And that includes the uh, first 11 chapters of this epistle. Doctrine which is the Word of God for all that uh, is said neg negatively uh, about doctrine and how it divides. Uh, this is what we're looking at. I believe without question there are those who cause divisions and offenses who are non-believers. Uh, they would be, we'd consider these to be wheat, uh, uh, tare, and goats. Goats and tare, of course we, we can't determine with certainty who those are. They are to grow together until the harvest, but uh, I believe without question that there are those who cause divisions and offenses. Uh, who are both non-believers as well as brethren in Christ. And so we have to be careful as we go through this text. I think that if you bear with me, I'll, I'll try to steer a straight line down, you know, through the middle of it and, and show you just exactly what this is talking about, what Paul is talking about here. There are, without question, uh, a numerous people, numerable people who who they don't have any idea of the truths of uh, what it means to be in Christ, of the truths of the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, his substitutionary sacrifice, you know, who come up with all kinds of weird ideas. And uh, those are probably the ones that we're, that we're looking at here in the 16th chapter. I believe that uh, there are, though, however, brethren in Christ who cause divisions and dissensions which are contrary to the truth of God's Word. And the only way that we can possibly know that is to know God's Word. There are people, folks, who read it every day with blind eyes, and the Holy Spirit has given us the opportunity to fellowship together in a way that the previous verses of this chapter describe. I believe that what we're seeing in the first 16 verses here in the final chapter is what any church ought to be. So let's just look at that for a moment. Paul obviously knew many of these people personally. You know, they're growing in love as one body in Christ. We see the word elect referred to uh, or chosen in the Lord. So doctrine comes into it. Eleven times we see the phrase in the Lord or in Christ. And we see wealthy and poor, uh, ordinary, important, male, female, freed, uh, freed slave, slave and both freed slave, Jew and Gentile, very diverse uh, group of people from every walk of life, growing through sound doctrine. And Romans is the most doctrinally deep letter in the New Testament, in my opinion, at least. And we live in a day when doctrine is shoved aside. Eleven chapters of solid doctrinal foundation before the practical section of this letter. So we're looking at saints who are deepening in their relationships with one another in the Lord. I counted over 30 names in these uh, two sections. They're called beloved. You've got a first convert in Asia. Uh, those who are called sister, those who are called brother, uh, Paul considering Rufus's mother as being his own mother. 
uh, Priscilla and, and Achaia had risked their lives for Paul. So these greetings reflect a, a wide diversity of people that are in the body of Christ in harmony with one another. Uh, I read through this and I see the church as it ought to be. So I'm looking at their love for one another, their personal interest in one another, extremely close relationships, family, okay? Helpful toward one another. You know, these people, they open their homes as house churches. Uh, they're referred to as fellow laborers, fellow workers in Christ Jesus. So they labor together. We, we see whole families that have come to faith in Christ through the gospel. None of these people were really famous or powerful in, in, the, in the eyes of the world religious system. None of them knew that their names would be enshrined in Scripture. And, of course, God knows our name, and we are just as important to Him. I think we need to, to take note of that fact. And I have to ask, you know, how would Paul have described me here if he had known me? And then we come to verse 17, Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So we come down to the problem of how do we deal with these people? And the word is avoid them. And I've had people over, over, over the years, they've asked me, well, Steve, what does it mean to, to avoid them? And, the, the, and my answer to that is avoid. That's, that's the word in the original text. We can't get around that. We are to avoid them which requires that I recognize the problem and, and we're not to, to go around, we know, avoiding our brother and in Christ. Do you follow what I'm saying here? So, you know, we've got to look at this very carefully. Literally, the Greek tells me to turn away from them. So, bear with me, if you will. I want to direct your attentions to, uh, to Galatians chapter 2, where we find that the council at Jerusalem had laid no particular works-oriented truth on the Gentile. You know, they seemed to be pillars, whatsoever they were, didn't make any difference to Paul. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I was stood him to the face because he was condemned. And my Bible says that he was to be blamed. It's a perfect passive participle. I want you to note that this is not the same word used by the Holy Spirit in Romans 8.1, there, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The word is katakrima. It's a compound word. It's, it's from the word kata, down, or according to, which intensifies krima, which, is the, uh, which means the results of judgment. Properly, the exact sentence of condemnation handed down after due process, establishing guilt. Okay, and now... There's another word that's uh, katagonosko. Okay, this is not uh, the same word. The word is katagonosko, uh, to blame. I condemn or I blame. And the meaning of that word is different than what we see in Romans 8.1. The word literally means to find uh, as decisively guilty on someone on the basis of direct personal acquaintance uh, by having a first-hand awareness of the facts, to charge as guilty someone with specific facts, okay? If you were in a, a courtroom and uh, the facts were presented uh, and you were found guilty, that's what the word means. So this is Peter, and I want you to note that Paul did not avoid him, okay? Paul didn't avoid Peter. And for 32 years now in teaching the scriptures, I've always been faced with how you face a brother who's teaching error. You know, there's tons of that on the internet. Most of it, of it you know, that you read, you know, it doesn't sound very loving, but I'm not sure how you'd do this where it did not, you know, at least to some people, it wouldn't sound unloving. 
it will always seem unloving to many uh, people, even Christians. I withstood him to the face because he stood condemned, okay? Do you suppose that there was someone there that said, well, Paul, now you're not being very loving. You know, I, I don't know. You know, for uh, the text says, it, it, the text says, for before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but, but, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas, Paul's pal, also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. Now wait a minute. All he did was not eat with some, with some Gentiles. He walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. What was Paul saying? He's saying that Peter, by his illustration, was teaching that Christ didn't do enough. And that's terrible. And he withstood him to the face. And that's about the only thing, folks, that I hear taught today, that Christ didn't do enough. Years ago, I wrote to one of the leading seminaries, and this has been a long time ago. It was back in the 90s. And I made an offhand comment. You know, I said that it, how wonderful it is that from the truth of the gospel that we know that spiritual life preceded personal faith in Christ, and I was the one who was avoided. You know, it makes me wonder, you know, what they do with these verses. Folks, a good tree brings forth good fruit, okay? What is walking contrary to the gospel? Walking contrary to the gospel says that it is, it is because it brought forth good fruit that it was a good tree. When the gospel says it brought forth good fruit because it was already a good tree. You know, a while back, uh, someone made a statement to me that, that he was working to change goats into sheep. And I said, well, you know, you know that's interesting. I don't believe you can pr provide one passage of scripture that would teach me that a goat ever turned into a sheep. I never heard another word from this guy. Until later on in an email, and it was quite some time later, he said, well, I haven't found a passage yet. And folks, he won't. And yet he's spending his life preaching that. What do we see in this book? Why is it wheat? Well, it was planted as wheat. Why is it tear? Because it was planted as tear. Why is it a sheep? Well, because it was born a sheep. Why is it a goat? Well, because it was born a goat. Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. So there are some plants that he didn't plant. He didn't plant tear. Folks, he didn't plant bad seed, okay? He said, the enemy hath done this. I didn't do it. I planted good seed. Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. Well, what's the converse of the verse? If he planted it, it will not be rooted up. You know, no wonder there's wonderful peace in the truth of the gospel. Peter was saying that peace is not there. God did something, but... Hey, he didn't do enough. You can't eat with Gentiles. And my Bible says that was contrary to the truth of the gospel, just not eating with Gentiles. How did Paul withstand Peter to the face and still do it in love? Well, Paul must have done that. He must have. For in the last chapter of 2 Peter, the apostle Peter, just before he dies, talks about his beloved brother Paul. So I have to conclude that Peter accepted very graciously Paul's opposition to what he did. He accepted the correction. And it, it, folks, it seems so simple what he did, I'll admit. He, he just didn't eat with a Gentile. But the implication is profound. To suggest that one is born again by what someone does is a simple suggestion, but the implications are profound. This book declares that you were born by the will of God, not by your will. Is that what you hear preached? 
not me. I mean, you, you have to be listening to different programs than I do. This book declares that God planted you, that He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world, that you believe in Him because He chose you. Ephesians 2. You believe according to the working of God. You don't believe because of anything you did. Now, it seems to me that to, to, uh, that seems to me to be a simple baby truth of Scripture. Once you're born by the will of God, you believe that your belief follows spiritual life. And I got the nastiest letter from the seminary suggesting that I was a heretic for believing what this book says. If that isn't what this book says, you show me. And again, I challenge any person to show me one verse of Scripture, any place, any passage of Scripture that says that you're born again by anything you do. Once I'm born by the will of God, once I'm His child, of course, I can believe, but carnality reverses it. And Peter is saying, you need one another to be perfect in Christ. You, you, you can't eat with a Gentile. And folks, I got to admit to you, you know, that that sounds so little a thing, just, you know, eating with a Gentile. I mean, so what? It's just Peter. He, all right, he's got this silly idea that Jews shouldn't eat with Gentiles. You know, we just forget it and love him in the Lord. That is not what the Holy Spirit had Paul do. As I read this passage of Scripture carefully, I believe that the Holy Spirit is indicating that Peter made a very serious doctrinal error. You know, Moses made one of those. The Lord said, Moses, I'm going to sanctify myself in the presence of Israel. Go out and strike the rock, and it'll bring forth water. And Moses, in his anger, struck it twice. Bad move. Why can't we just say, you know, wait a minute, Lord. He was, you know, yeah, he was sort of mad. You know, so we hit it twice. So what? What's the big deal? Well, because Christ only died once. That is serious doctrinal error. It's a doctrinal error that every Arminian ought to face. If you are redeemed and then you lose that salvation, Christ has to die again. That is a, that's a terrible doctrinal error. And because of that, Moses never entered the land of rest. Because you did not believe in me, you will not lead this people into the land that I've given them. Terrible doctrinal error. It was Moses. But this is Peter. When the Lord revealed himself to Paul on the road to Damascus, he went up to Jerusalem, spent two weeks with Peter, you know, I, I get the impression that they were buddies, and now he's he withstands him to the face. He did this publicly. He pointed out that from that one little act, which appears to be incidental, Peter is preaching a contrary truth. It's no wonder that Christians ought to have peace and rest and joy when they recognize the all-sufficiency of Christ. This letter that I received spent a lot of time pointing out that Jesus Christ died for every single human and, and that this particular theologian had suggested that his death was substitutionary. Well, of course it is. Anybody that knows any Greek or any scripture knows that it was substitutionary. He did not die in every man's place. He did not. If we're unwilling to take scripture at face value, we allow our emotions to dictate what seems to be the truth. Peter is showing himself to be righteous by not eating with a Gentile. That is works of law. Okay? In actual fact, he is not made righteous by anything that he did, that Peter did. He's made righteous by the obedience of Christ. That's what the text says. And to take that truth away from the Gentile, I, what do we do? You know, Peter is made righteous by not eating with us. I mean, what in the world do we do? You know, not what do we do? Not eat with Jews? And folks, I don't know what it did to those Gentiles, but I see that even Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation. He did stand condemned because what he 
because what he said and what he did was contrary to Scripture. And so if you put him in a court, he stands condemned by what he did. He is righteous in Christ. And he obviously took this corrective move by Paul because in the last chapter of 2 Peter, he called Paul his beloved brother. The popular feeling among Christians is that the word condemned or perish always means go to hell. It doesn't. Why by your work should your brother perish? Romans 14. Well, surely none of you would say that Romans 14 is saying that you can do something that would send your brother to hell. There is a sense where a person is condemned to hell. There's other cases where a believer is condemned because he didn't walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. He's to be blamed. We see that in the difference in the two words in the original text. Peter stands condemned under the truth of the gospel, but the word doesn't mean he's headed for hell. Much of modern evangelism stands condemned under the truth of the gospel. And folks, this book is a serious revelation of the finished work of Jesus Christ. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God, Galatians 2.19. If you're not dead to law, you can't live unto God. And that is exactly contrary to everything I hear. You know, you got to have a lot of good works if you're living unto God. If my Bible says, if it's all about what I do, then I've got very little time to think about what Christ did. Because i I got to spend my whole time thinking about what I'm doing. I have to concentrate on myself, not on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And self becomes... The, the one who's glorified, not Christ, folks. It's just that simple. That's what a lot of Christians are doing. They're concentrating so much on trying to live the right kind of life and doing the right kind of thing that they have virtually no time to contemplate all that God has done for them in Christ. And I long for people to study this book as seriously as they can and point out to me where these things aren't true. Go back to Romans 5 for, for just a moment. Romans chapter 5. You know, do I believe the fifth chapter of Romans or do I ignore it? God commends His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died in our place. That's substitutionary. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Where are you there? Well, you're the enemy. Were you asking to be reconciled? Were you seeking reconciliation? You are reconciled to God. How? How were you reconciled to God? By the death of His Son. Nothing else. Nothing that you did. You're reconciled to God by the death of His Son. God declares, I sinned in Adam. That's enough for me. God said it. I believe it. God declares that I was made righteous in Christ. That's enough for me. If we proclaimed this, folks, there would be a lot more peace, a lot more rest, a lot more joy among those who call themselves Christians. We wouldn't wind up with easy believism, and we certainly wouldn't wind up with lordship salvation and other aspects that I've, I've had Christians come to me in tears over. What we would wind up with, for the most part, I believe, would be the beautiful picture of how the church should be, which is what we are looking at here. Note how that Paul did not avoid Peter. This is important. Take note of the fact. Paul didn't avoid Peter, okay? But he confronted him. Note how that Paul obviously, or note how that Peter obviously accepted the correction. You know, and I believe if he had not, then he would have been the one avoided here in the 17th verse. Does, does that make any sense? Now, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Titus 3.9. 
but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject the factious man after a first and second warning, okay? Knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self, self-condemned. I, I think it only took one warning by Paul in the case of Peter, okay? That's it, that's all it took. To me, nothing makes more sense than to see the unity here in this final chapter sharply contrasted with that which causes division. A fitting end, a fitting end to this amazing, amazing epistle, which I hope to conclude in my next video. Look, I love you all. I truly do. It's hot here in southeast Oklahoma. Looking forward to the fall. Thank you for all of your prayers and all of your support. Thank you for watching.